It's time for This Week in Science and Education, the Internet show that talks about all things health research and science related, new discoveries, new cures. How do we take this information and how do we make it relevant for the teachers and students in today's classroom? We're going to find out next. Stay tuned for This Week in Science and Education. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning. At Sheridan, students shine brighter. Visit their website at SheridanShineBrighter.com. Hey everybody, it's time for This Week in Science and Education. This is episode 42, recorded Tuesday, May the 24th, 2011. Cracking the Kraken Code, coming up next. Hey everybody, it's time for This Week in Science and Education. This is your host, Kevin Kugler, broadcasting live from the University of Western Ontario. Joining me, as always, my good friend and colleague, Mr. Colin Jago, Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. What are you saying, Colin? <laughs> what am I saying? What am I saying? I don't know. It's finally nice here. I'm saying that. It was a good weekend, and uh, it's finally starting to warm up, so I think uh, I think the winter might actually be over now. I think you're right. I uh, had a weekend where we had three beautiful days in Woodstock. <laughs> um, only two days were supposed to rain, and I was really actually calling for rain this weekend because my wife informed me Friday that she had landscaping booked for me all three days oh. solid, so I thought, well, at least She's Sunday and Monday, you know, it'll be raining. Exactly. Yeah, but that didn't work. So I'm, my shoulders are sore. My back is sore. It's it's completely oh, terrible. Hey, guess where bad. I was last Friday? Uh, I don't know. I was at the National Science Fair, my friend. Remember uh, going oh, yes to Ottawa? Yes, you were. Yes, you were. Yeah. Yes. How was that? It was great. You remember that uh, student that uh, did the hockey helmet? Uh, the hockey um, helmet. Um, yep. Yeah. One. No kidding. He won his division. Good stuff. Yep. He sure did. He Good was uh, fascinating. Yep, so I actually got to interview him. That'll be episode 43 is my coverage of the National Science Fair. But what a what a tremendous awesome. day walking around talking to those kids. You would have loved it. Good. Well, I'm sure I would have, but I was on my way to the cottage, and there was no flies up there yet, so it was just as nice. Oh, what a beautiful segue. <laughs> Speaking of flies, there is Dr. Thomas Merritt up at Laurentia <laughs> University in Sudbury. Hey, Thomas. Hi, guys. It's great to be here. Uh, winter stuff. has not left. We we actually have a frost warning for tonight, so just in oh, case you're thinking of moving. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry to hear. Thanks. <laughs> hey, Thomas. I understand we have two really special guests here today, and they came by way of you. Thank you very much for sending this uh, copy of Kraken, by the way, to uh, Colin and I. This has been a wonderful read. But uh, let's have you introduce our guests today. Sure, by all means. They actually come by way of my mom. Um, and I, I got to tell you, this is this is as you said our 42nd episode, um, and I am probably more nervous about this episode than anything we've ever done in the past because Wendy has met my mom. What what if this goes poorly? Um, I mean, the Cape, Cape Cod's not a big place. It'll get back to mom that, that this didn't go well. Um, Do you want Wendy Colin Williams? To do so? No, I'll be okay. <laughs> Uh, Wendy Williams is a science journalist, trained as a science journalist, an author, lives in Cape Cod now, um, and came into the bookstore where my mother works to give an author presentation. Actually, Wendy, it's been a couple of months now, I think. Um, and somewhere in there started a conversation with my mom saying, oh, well, my, my son's a scientist, and he used to work on squid. Uh, and then we emailed back and forth, and Wendy very graciously agreed to, to come on and talk to us about her book, uh, Kraken, The Curious, Exciting, and Slightly Disturbing Science of Squid. Um, which we've all read. And along with mm -hmm. the conversations with Wendy, she mentioned Joe DeGeorgis. DeGeor De Sorry, Joe. Uh, I can't be the first person who's had a hard time with that name. Um, <laughs> as, as a collaborator and colleague and, and the person that really kept her science in line as Wendy was writing uh, the book, and, and one of the things that, that had struck me, and I mentioned this to Wendy when we talked about it, was as good a read as the book is, the science is really good. And it, it's difficult for those two things to mesh. And I think one of the reasons it does in, in this particular case um, is that you've got a really good author and a really good scientist that are sort of cross-checking each other uh, and making that work. So thank you to both Joe and Wendy uh, for, for coming on. Um, oftentimes what we do next is, is we ask for the, the, the guests to give us a little blurb about what they do, tell us a little bit about their background and, and what brought them to uh, the, the place they are now. And so I thought maybe we could do that same kind of format today. Um, and Wendy, we'll maybe start with you. This book didn't come out of nowhere. Um, so maybe give us a little bit of your history and, and what led to uh, your fascination with squid um, and, and writing this book. 
Well, I think the first thing I have to say is that I didn't grow up on the ocean. I actually grew up in the Midwest where our idea of a fish dinner was uh, fish sticks and tartar sauce. So when I came to the East Coast and learned about the ocean, I was uh, curious. I was excited, but I was also slightly disturbed to find out about all the strange things that lived in the ocean. I came here to be a reporter on a newspaper, and uh, while I was a reporter, I got a fellowship to be a science journalism fellow at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, and it was there I learned the astounding and perhaps a little bit horrifying fact that our brain neuron, the cell that makes a uh, aids our thinking and our existence in life was pretty much similar to the brain neuron of the squid, an animal which I knew very little about, but uh, had a very distinct reaction to the first time I saw it. <laughs> so that was a couple, that was, that was a long time ago, and it, it's been for quite a while that I wanted to write a book about that, but it took me a while to figure out how it would be possible to write a book, a popular science book, that people would actually want to read and at the same time explain that science. So this is the result. Yeah. I, that's a neat story. I, when I was an undergrad at University of North Carolina, I did my undergrad thesis on cuttlefish behavior uh, with uh, Gene Bowl, who's one of the, the scientists you mentioned in, in your mm. book. Um, and at, at one point of my undergrad, I, I didn't know what I was going to do next, but whatever it was was going to be cuttlefish or squid or octopus science. Uh, and, and unfortunately or fortunately, one way or the other, that, that got sidetracked and never did happen. Um, but uh, maybe I'll have to figure a, a way back into this. And then, Joe, give us a little uh, background on um, your connection. How, do you, how are you involved with a book on squid? Uh, well, I, uh, I grew up in Massachusetts and uh, under the influence of Jacques Cousteau documentaries and things of that nature, and became an oceanography major as an undergrad. And I really wanted to get a job at the Woods Hole Oceanographic, but ended up finding a job across the street at the Marine Biological Laboratory uh, as a scuba diver and a collector of marine organisms for biological research. So it turns out that uh, MBL had this dive team, and I was really into that stuff. Uh, I still like it, and started collecting uh, these organisms and each species is used for a different type of research. A starfish is uh, usually used to study cell division or sea urchins and uh, horseshoe crabs are used to study uh, blood and squid happen to be a nice model to understand the neurophysiology, how nerve cells function. So with my experience as a diver at the MBL, I slowly uh, went from an oceanography guy to a narrow guy, and yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I met Wendy at the MBL when she was trying to interview people for the book. One thing, so you tell us a little bit more about the, your your work now as, as, a, as a neurobiologist. But unless I've forgotten something, one of the, the there you spent a lot of time talking about the similarities between the the neurons in, in uh, squid and cuttlefish and and, and vertebrates, but aren't the invertebrate neurons unmyelinated, isn't that one of the big differences between um, vertebrate and invertebrate neuro systems? Yes, that's true. Uh, you know, that, that explains the thickness of the neuron. As you know, the myelin acts as an insulation, so it conserves the electrical action potential as it passes along the neuron. Right. Um, squid lack that, and to compensate, they evolved a thicker diameter. Uh, and it's just a property of physics that the thicker the wire, the faster the electricity passes. So they use right. speed to conserve the electricity, whereas we use an insulation, as, as you said, myelin. Yeah, okay, so, so let's back up. Let's tell the, the, the students and, and teachers that are listening, mm -hmm. what is the squid giant axon? So squid are this great model in the same way that we use mice or I use fruit flies. They're a fantastic model for neurobiology. But it's not squid in general. It's one little tiny piece of the squid. And what is that? Right, so it's, it's, the axon is uh, the shaft, the main trunk of a nerve cell. And one thing that I should point out is, uh, even though we're at the marine biological laboratory, I wouldn't consider myself a marine biologist. I mean, I love the ocean and I love diving and all of that, but I did my postdoc at the National Institutes of Health, and I'm interested in uh, human 
uh, neuronal function and neuronal disease. So the big advantage of squid over studying other models like mice and so on, or even, even human tissue, is that the squid has a nerve cell that's about a thousand times thicker than those found in humans. It's about a millimeter thick and it's about uh, eight to ten centimeters long. It looks like a piece of thick monofilament fishing string. And it's very easy to dissect out of the squid and we can manipulate that cell and try to understand how neurons function based on those found in the squid system. I think yeah, I'd like to back it up a little bit if I may. Uh, we're talking about squid and one of the interesting things, Wendy, that I um, learned from your book, not knowing an awful lot about squid to begin with. I always thought of squid as being animals, you know, or, or you know, foot and a half, maybe two feet, uh, you know, long, fairly small organisms. But uh, and you know, you hear all these fish stories about giant squid living in the ocean and thing, and you never really come across them. Um, that was absolutely fascinating to me to learn about all, all the different species out there. Um, the amount of research that you must have had to put into something like this is is amazing to learn all of that. Just talk a little bit for those younger students that are listening to the show. What are the different types of squid and, and the relative sizes that they could hope to, uh, to see if they're traveling at different depths in the ocean? Oh, my gosh. Well, <laughs> I think the thing that interested me about squid was the variety. I mean, I don't, we don't even know how many species of squid there are in, in the ocean. Maybe we know half of them. Maybe we don't even know that much. There's, it's a mysterious world down there. But on one end of the spectrum, we seem to have these things called colossal squid and giant squid. Um, the colossal squid is even wickeder than the giant squid, and the giant squid, in my opinion, is plenty wicked enough. Colossal squid is this kind of big blob-like thing that has swivel hooks on its arms and uh, a big light bulb kind of light organs behind its eyes that they look like. For, for cars or something. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are these tiny, tiny little things that you can barely see. Um, one of the things that's really fun about squid is they've been around a long time. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years, uh, maybe longer. Uh, we know that we split from them on the evolutionary tree more than 700 million years ago, which is pretty far, pretty long ago. And so they've had a lot of time to be creative and imaginative and, and uh, to cook up a, a world full of squid and squid that can fly through the air. And, and what do you think of, Joe? Any other kinds of squid that are strange and weird? I think they're all strange and weird. That's what makes them so fun. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, uh, at the MBL they collect squid uh, five days a week from about May 1st until Thanksgiving. That's the squid mm -hmm. season. And, well, you never get sick of looking at those things. They're really fascinating creatures, and uh, yeah. they're quite intelligent. Uh, they hunt. They have very elaborate uh, courtship rituals where they use uh, their ability to change color in that process to communicate with one another, and they're really fascinating creatures. And you, you never know what they're going to come up with next. You just never know what clever little idea they'll, they'll come up with. And one of the things I've been thinking about lately um, is we're surprised that these animals seem intelligent. But if you think about it, it's a very, very complicated world down there in the ocean. We live on a sort of a, a, a somewhat two-dimensional plane. They live in this world where things can come at them from any angle at any time, and there's all kinds of trickery and deceit down there. You might think that something is an innocent, pretty little glowing light, like something on a Christmas tree, and it might all of a sudden turn out to be this predatory monster that's going to eat you. So I, I think it, it's not really that surprising that cephalopods are as smart as they are. I wanted to, to call the book myself The Vertebrates Conceit because I love the idea that um, only, only living things with backbones are smart enough to be able to figure things out. But I was told that was too geeky and it got named Kraken instead. <laughs> you know, the joys of marketing. Um, yeah. yeah. 
about, uh, you know, the three-dimensional world down there. And that's something that I had never really considered either, and I'll bet some of the younger students hadn't either. Whereas when you're in a two-dimensional world, such as humans, and we're walking along the street, you know, you're looking for cars coming at you. You're looking for, you know, if you're in Africa, you might be looking for some predators like lions that are running at you. But you never really think about looking up to see if there's a big bird of prey that's coming down or something coming up from uh, Yeah, know, from or down. Ground. Yeah, that was a real. That was a point that you made in the book, and I thought that was really interesting. We uh, we don't have to consider that at all. Right. I I mean it's very complicated down there, and no wonder there are all these strange lights and unusual goings on, and and some animals get to be so huge, and other animals survive by being barely visible, so tiny. Everybody's got their own special little strategies down there as a way to cope with this complicated world and in comparison to which our 21st century life is almost kindergarten. Speaking <laughs> of uh, strange goings on, let's go to Colin Jago who keeps popping in and out like a Christmas bulb going on and off. Colin, uh, let's get to you uh, before we lose you. <laughs> I apologize for my connections. Uh, Kevin and I have some troubleshooting to do after the show apparently. Um, <laughs> Listen, this, this, the, I read the book in, in, in one afternoon. I, I started it because I had some time, and I didn't stop until I was done. It was, it was really, really wonderful to sit down and dive into it. And when the one thing I really liked, or well, one of the things I really liked is, is and I, I'm sensing the same thing from, from you um, in terms of doing your research. The more I read, the more I learned that I had no idea about, right, just the little twists on things. And it, was just, it was just fascinating. Um, we mentioned earlier, and Joe mentioned it too, about uh, using um, the axon, for example, as a model species to study uh, neurons in humans. But then you also alluded to some other things about uh, horseshoe crab for blood, and, and uh, you mentioned another one as well. Could you maybe just talk about what a model species is and some of the science behind using one of these model species, and, and why do humans then use these, and what do we learn from them? Yeah, sure. I mean, the best models are the ones that help you elucidate some uh, biological problem. So, uh, for instance, the how cells divide uh, is very easily studied in sea urchins. And it, sea urchins are very plentiful. They're easy to collect. They have many eggs. Uh, they're easy to fertilize. And of course, we're very interested in how cells divide because cancer is right. uncontrolled cell division. And uh, so understanding how the normal mechanism happens is extremely important. There are a number of Nobel Prizes that have been won by MBL scientists that have used uh, both urchins and surf clams to study cellular division. Mm. Um, and when I was young, we were, we were uh, given the task of collecting those surf clams and urchins. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, you just sort of struck on something that made me think of some things we've talked about here in the past. Um, you're talking about understanding sea urchin um, cell division to then understand, you know, just the process of cell division on a basic level, but then applications to things like cancer and that sort of thing. Um, we've, we've talked about sort of the difference between basic science and then like directed science that's got an end goal. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm asking your opinion or, or, or if you can give me an example of something of, of how the basic science of studying this has led to that or or is it the other way around that we see we're trying to understand cancer and we know that sea urchins are a way to get there. Like which which way does it sort of drive in your opinion and in the research that you see? Well certainly, you know, many of these discoveries are classic discoveries that, that have happened uh, decades ago in some cases. <laughs> but uh, and when basic science was more the common uh, way to go about doing things, but I don't see any issue with doing directed science either. I mean, we're we're hoping that some of the fundamental aspects that we might learn in squid, for instance, would ultimately be applied to human biology. Uh, now, uh, I'm looking at a protein that's involved in Alzheimer's disease, and they think mm. that this particular protein uh, may link to motors that exist inside nerve cells, and I'm interested in trying to figure out what the wild type role of this particular protein is inside squid neurons and hope that it'll have some benefit to this disease in humans. Wow. Wait, what can, let me follow up on that just for quickly. Mm -hmm. What can you actually do with a squid neuron in, in that particular protein system? Because I, I know that the people have recently started working on a couple of protein systems in Drosophila that, that seem to be tied into to Alzheimer's. But what, what does having that squid system give you that you don't have in another system? 
Well, uh, as we said, the squid neuron is very thick. So I study a process that was discovered in the squid giant axon at the MBL uh, in 1980 is the process called axonal transport. And essentially, inside all neurons, ours and squid, there are tracks. And cargos are transported back and forth along these tracks, and they're powered by proteins that act as molecular motors. So I've been very interested in that as a fundamental aspect of biology. It turns out, though, that these, this protein involved in Alzheimer's disease called amyloid precursor protein is thought to be the trailer hitch that links the cargo to the motor. So we're able to study both the transport process in the squid because it's so thick. You can use a microscope and look inside the squid neuron and see this transport process happen. You can also dissect the nerve cell out and extrude the cytoplasm like toothpaste out of a tube. And that transport process happens in that toothpaste, if you want to think yeah. of it that way. <laughs> and there's a track, there's a car, there's a motor, and there's a fuel, ATP, which is the universal fuel for biological systems. So because we have that ability to extrude the cytoplasm and study the contents outside of the cell, there's a real advantage to figuring out how the system works because we can break the process apart. We can separate the different components and then add them back together one at a time to try to figure out what's actually going on. We can't do this with other nerve cells because there's just not enough uh, cytoplasm to be able to extract it from a human or mouse neuron, for instance. Yeah, and I, I think one of, one of the other factors there that, that Joe explained to me is um, the quantity of it and the cheapness of it, because if there's one thing we have a lot of around here, it's squid. <laughs> but the other thing that I found really interesting that Joe explained to me was that once you squeeze this toothpaste out of the tube, or use other words, cytoplasm out of the axon, what was amazing to me was that this material will continue to function. Um, for what? It, did you tell me a couple of hours at least afterwards? Sure. So you can still oh. do the research that you need to do on this material even after it's been, been squeezed out. Yeah, that's right. Are we still limited? So when, when I was in Galveston, Texas at the Marine Biomedical Institute, they were trying to, to come up with better ways for squid aquaculture. Are we still limited to working on squid when you can actively collect the squid? So do you have well, to do your research from May until the end of squid season? Uh, well, there are species that have been successfully cultured. And uh, Roger Hanlon, who is now at the MBL, is, yeah. uh, was involved in that particular group that you mentioned early on. And uh, I was his summer student one year. I see. Yeah, so uh, I just saw Roger yesterday. And uh, he is successfully, that group has successfully cultured a number of species. But the species that we tend to work on, the local species, is particularly difficult to culture. And they're not really sure why that is. Yeah. We're talking but there, today there are with, other uh, squid Whitney that Williams and Joe DeGeorgis um, about some squid. Sorry to interrupt you, Wendy. I just wanted to get that in there for people who are listening. Back to you, no. Wendy. No, that's right. I was just going to say there, there are other squid, I think, that can be cultured. And one of my favorite is the bobtail squid, the Hawaiian squid, that um, Margaret McFallen Guy, a scientist that I interviewed, likes to call the couch potato of the squid world. That squid, as, as Joe explained, tend to be very reactive, I guess, in part because they have this, these axons that are, give them a lot of speed. But for some reason, the couch potato, the uh, bobtail squid, seems to be a little bit calmer and a little bit more laid back. And so, um, researchers are able to do different kinds of experiments with them than they might do with um, our local squid. But the other thing that's really fun about that, I don't know if you've even read about this, Joe, is that bobtail squid are so well adapted to certain aspects of our human existence that uh, they were recently sent out into space to see what happens. Oh, I didn't there's know a, that. Yep, there's a, there's a bobtail squid in space right now, even as we speak, heading uh, up to uh, where is it? Up to up to the shuttle. Oh and my! People, Let's get them on the show. <laughs> I know it'd be very cool, wouldn't it? It'd be very funny. <laughs> and what they want to do is is study um, bacteria, and and it, we we know something about how the bacteria interacts with the squid, 
And so I guess what researchers want to do is see if that bacterial interaction with the squid changes if the squid goes up into space. So that, that, those, that uh, bacterial... Sorry, Sorry, Thomas, go that, ahead. That bacterial interaction is a really neat story, Wendy. Can, can you tell, tell our listeners a little bit more about that particular story? You've got a squid and you've got bacteria, and we actually know quite a bit now about how they interact. Well, I can explain it a little bit, and then maybe Joe can get into more depth. Is that something you know about, Joe? No. I don't know very much about it, but one thing that might be worth uh, pointing out is that we have more... Uh, bacteria cells in our body than we do have uh, human cells. Yeah. Bacteria yeah, are everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that was fascinating. In, fa in fact, we're really just condo projects for bacteria, 21st century <laughs> condo projects so the bacteria can have a better life. That's how I look at life. So but that's these that one of, Isn't that one of the reasons we're, we're looking at the bobtail squid? Because we actually know or we think we can understand a little bit more about the interactions between that squid species and the bacteria that it, uh, it doesn't culture, it's the, the right term for it, but it, the, the bacteria that live within that uh, organism. Right, right. There's a bacteria called Vibrio fischeri. I think that's how we pronounce it. That's pretty common in the water. And um, the bobtail squid has to have this guy living within it in order to be able to survive because it's the bacteria that actually make the lights that camouflage the squid. So without the lights from this bacteria, the squid would be seen by the bad guys and eaten. So it's this kind of happy marital where one person, uh, one, one, one species provides the household and the other species provides the protection. And uh, it's a fascinating interaction that uh, Margaret McFarlane Guy has been studying for quite a long time about what exactly happens when this bacteria is brought into the animal. What are the cell changes that go on in the animal due to the presence of this bacteria? Um, and one of the things that she says is that by better understanding this, we can understand more about for example, why women shouldn't have cesarean sections. Because right. we need to have these correct doses of these various bacteria in our body in order to be able to live somewhat like the bobtail squid needs to have that kind of interaction go on in order to survive. Those aren't the is, is uh, eyeballs of the uh, bobtail squid uh, behind uh, Joe there. I think Rob Yeomans is holding those up. Where are those eyeballs from? <laughs> <Just out of laughs> curiosity. <laughs> I didn't even know those were there. Um, that, that's uh, w one of the things that I did for the book was to go out to the West Coast. That's not a bobtail squid. That's a um, that's a Decidigus gigas, a jumbo squid. And the fellow catching them is uh, John Field from NOAA. He's six foot five, so you can see how big wow. those animals are. And um, part of the book, of course, is about a young woman who's getting her doctorate by studying these animals in the, in the wild, how they behave. And uh, we went out there with a very funny marine biology high school teacher, Rob Yeomans, who doubles as a fisherman. So when we brought the animals back, he uh, cut out the eyes and decided to use them as souvenirs. <laughs> so you get a sense of how big those animals are. And those are animals that have started to migrate up the west coast of California and up the west coast, sometimes as far north as Canada. They're a compar I don't want to say new species because we suspect they've been there before. But in recent years, they have turned up in large numbers. And fishermen are not entirely happy about this because the animals prey on the same species that the fish, fishermen like to catch. So we want to know more. Julie and her research team, John Field and everybody, wants to know more about why these guys are coming. Is it a result of changing currents in the ocean? Is it a result of a warmer ocean? And when they get there, what do they do? I want to go back to Colin again, if we could, for a quick second before we lose him again. I think that time he was off again. researching the squids in space, but uh, Colin, what yeah, are you doing? <laughs> no, I was trying to get back. Um, just, as I was reading the book, Wendy, and it, this is sort of, it, 
as a high school teacher, right? Because that's that's sort of what what I do. Um, not at the moment, obviously, but that that's what I, what I do. I got thinking about about the writing process from a, from a journalist point of view and from from an author's point of view, and how easy or difficult is it to bring this entire body of knowledge into something that's accessible, like for you know anybody to read and I mean I see this being read by a high school student you know quite easily I was reading some of the reviews on Amazon and people you know talked about how how accessible it is to learn something about science with within this book so maybe you can talk a bit about the research you did and then how you bring that as an author uh, to an audience well I couldn't have done it without Joe I mean, I have to. I, I really do have to be honest about that it was Joe who really um, provided a lot of the backdrop, a lot of the background, and said these are the important stories. These, this is the tale that I'd love if you'd tell, and, and you know, the whole 100-year history or almost 100-year history of the squid axon and what sure. it's done for us. So uh, the first step is to find scientists who are kind enough to give you a lot of time. Joe gave me a lot of time. He was very generous and very kind and who are willing to sort of take you through that process because when you're doing a book of this wide scope, you can't possibly do all the work yourself. You really rely on, on the kindness of scientists, the kindness of strangers, mm -hmm. you know. You just call them up and you say, well, I want to write a book about this. And surprisingly, astonishing numbers of scientists say, I'd love to help. And they do help, you know. They explain. They begin at the beginning, you know. One plus one equals two, because sometimes you don't even know that much, and and lead you all the way through the process. And in, in Joe's case, he really, really helped perfect the wording sometimes, and 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 go over the facts so that it was as clear as possible, but also as scientifically accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of that is you have to be someone who likes to have fun. You have to like to go out into the world and see things. It's a lot of scholarship, a lot of reading, a lot of trying to be very careful. But at the same time, someone who says, oh, yeah, I definitely like to go to the West Coast and take a ride out to catch a Humboldt squid. I don't know what a Humboldt squid is, but I'll go. <laughs> so there's a lot, a lot of different, different aspects in that. I've got to go back to uh, Thomas for a second. He's practically jumping off his chair. I know he's been anxious to get in here. Sorry, Thomas. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. The, the great conversation. Uh, just backing up one, one or two topics, um, the, the example that you, that you gave of the bacterial colonization in, in, in squid and, and what that tells us about bacterial colonization of, of people and, and, you know, the dangers of cesarean section in a, in a way that we hadn't necessarily thought about that. Um, and, and Joe's work with, with Alzheimer's using the model of the, the squid axon. And these are both examples of, of ways that we're using science um, to address real world questions in, in ways that we wouldn't have guessed ahead of time. Nobody sat down to look at um, the bobtail squid with the idea that this might tell us something about birth dynamics. And that's just not how the system worked. Um, and I, I think those are both really neat examples of, of why applied research is awesome, but we really need to be doing basic fundamental science because you just don't know ahead of time um, where things are going. Um, Wendy, you, you have a background as a, as a science journalist, um, mm -hmm. and you, you were just talking about talking to scientists and, and that you were surprised that many of us were, were interested to give you time and, and talk with you. I think that we're all really excited about what we do or we wouldn't do what we do. We, this is not the kind of job you go into um, because you know, you're going to be rich and famous. You go into it because you're <laughs> passionate and excited about something. But we're oftentimes not very good communicators. That's also why we go into science. Um, and so it, it's, it can be a difficult match you know, to, to find that. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about you as a science journalist. How did you decide to go into science journalism? And we've talked with, with students in the past about you know, alternative careers in science rather than going on to be a professor or a doctor. Um, Talk a little bit about being a, a, a science journalist. You mentioned to me in one of our conversations an editor that was a huge part of nurturing you as a developing journalist. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, to, to be honest with you, I started off as a daily journalist at a newspaper. And if you want to be a professional writer, there's no better training than that because, as I told you, you can't go out for your beer at night till you finish your story. You don't get to say um, writer's block and, oh, I'm too anxious today and... 
I don't know, whatever, you know, it's a job. It, it's, it's a job. What I do is a job just like any other job. Some people are teachers and some people are nurses and some people are science journalists, although we don't get paid as much as other people these days. <laughs> but it's just, it's something that I do. And I didn't intend to become a science journalist. Um, I had a wonderful editor when I was a journalist here at this small local daily, the Cape Cod Times, who uh, in those days encouraged me to follow my intellectual interests. So one day I said, gee, I'd like to go and uh, spend some time studying at the Hastings Center for Medical Ethics. And my editor, Bill Bryski, said, wonderful idea. Tell me when you get back, we'll send your checks. And then uh, yeah. I'd, been a Peace, I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer, so I said at one point, gee, I'd like to go back and write about Africa. And my editor said, wonderful idea. How long will you be gone? Where shall we send your checks? It was just a fantastic era to be a journalist in the 1970s. And yeah. um, at some point, I got interested in medicine. And as I say, I'm on Cape Cod, so... Where do you go? You go to Woods Hole. And there were a lot of wonderful programs and wonderful lectures at Woods Hole. And uh, that's wonderful about the community is that people are welcome there. You don't have to have a doctorate. You just have to be interested in something and curious and ask questions. So um, I, I, Rob Yeomans, the, the marine science teacher from uh, Newburyport High School, came out yeah, west. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the eyeball guy came, came out west with us. And when he came back, he said that the thing that surprised him most about the trip was how much fun scientists were. He said, oh, I thought these guys were going to show up in coats and ties and, you know, from Stanford University must be very important. And I, I said, no, actually, scientists are pretty much the most fun group of people I've ever met. It's a wonderful life. I haven't life. met any fun ones. Have you, Colin? <laughs> <laughs> a I'm a fun one. Joe's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, had, Joe knows how to have a lot of fun in life. No, I found a few. <laughs> all right, well, let's So, let's, so let's, I mean, uh, there, there's all kinds of things you can do with science. You don't have to have a doctorate degree. I have a, a, an undergraduate degree in uh, English literature. Hmm. But I read a lot. And I've been doing yeah. this for a long time. You can tell I'm not 20 years old anymore. So I've been doing it for a long time. You know, it's really important to have a good backup these days. We all have information that we want to protect. And we want to make sure that we can retrieve. There's a lot of stories, and I'm much of a culprit as anybody on this, that we just don't have adequate protection anymore on our computers. We seem to be so busy with our lives that we don't take the time to sit down and set up an appropriate backup. Documents, pictures, research, all sorts of things that we have on our computers, and we've got to make sure that it's protected. Well, how are we going to do that? Why don't you give Mueller Systems a try? Their website is MuellerData.com slash VROCK. That's M-U-L-L-E-R-D-A-T-A dot com slash V-R-O-C. If you visit that website free for 90 days, you can download, install, and configure their software. Make sure that it works for you. If you get stuck or you're not sure how to do it, give them a call. They'll walk you through it. Again, that website is MuellerData.com slash VROCK. We thank them very much for their support of our podcasting programs at Virtual Research are on call, and we look forward to working with them some more in the future. MuellerData.com slash VROC. Get that data protected, folks. I have a question, um, and I'm not sure who to direct this at, Wendy, if it should go to you or if it should go to Joe, so I'll just put the question out there. Of course, the book prompted the question. Um, and I'm not going to get all the scientific terms right here because I'm not a scientist, as everybody knows. The one the interesting right thing that I – thank you. <laughs> Good group of guys. The, um, one of the interesting things I read in your book, Wendy, was about this ability for squid to camouflage themselves in, in the ocean and how some of the research surrounding that might have – some type of application in the in the military for soldiers who are overseas and uh, or in, in some type of a um, environment where a better type of camouflage is um, would be needed. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the research behind that and how that will actually translate itself into um, that type of application. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which one of you would be more apt to. Uh, oh, I think that. Joe might be able to answer that better than me. Well, well I'm not sure that I can. Uh, I mean, the the uh, squid have a, a specialized cell in their skin called a chromatophore, and the chromatophores are different colors, and they can dilate or expand 
a certain cell that's under neuronal control. So they, they can use their brains to decide what colors they want to change and, and to camouflage if that's what they want to do. Or at times, they, when they want to be aggressive, they're trying to do the exact opposite. They're, they're trying to make themselves look tough, and they turn red and all sorts of different colors. Um, so it's under, so the, the changing of, of color occurs through either dilating or retracting this pigment within these cells in the skin. And that uh, is, is probably muscle that ultimately causes that uh, restriction or expansion of those cells. But they, they're extremely visual animals. Uh, even when they hatch, they're about a sixteenth of an inch long, and they use vision to school. Uh, they stay together after they hatch from the eggs, and they, they take a look at each other, and there's no larval stage. They hatch as little tiny adults, and they can ink, and they can grab things with their tentacles and all those sorts of things and change color. And their are, eyes are very large, as we've uh, seen and we've been talking about, and, and that's because they use vision as a major form of communication with one another. Um, how that will uh, translate into um, camouflage for military applications or others, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, they probably can, can gain an understanding of how patterning leads to camouflage. That would be my guess, and uh, that, again, is, is some work that Roger Hanlon's group is doing at, at the MBL. Yeah, I, I, I've read something about I, that. I think it also Please. has something to do with um, the way, the, the tricks that the squid and other animals, um, we've all seen the wonderful videos, or I think we've all seen the wonderful videos of the octopuses in the water. By the way, people say octopuses, they don't say octopi. Of the octopuses in the water that you can't see until the underwater camera gets right up on them, and then all of a sudden they materialize. Whoa, there's an octopus there. How do they do that? What are the, what are the tricks that they're using to fool our eyes? I think that's a direction that people are, are curious about. And I've seen this for myself. I mean, especially the particular animal that Joe was, was talking about is the... Um, What? Sepi. No, not the sepi. My husband's over on the side. He's trying to rem remind me of the word. Okay, this the person who wants to be a millionaire, you can't phone a friend in the middle of the show. <laughs> <laughs> the cuttlefish. Cuttle cuttlefish are these wonderful, wonderful animals that I found absolutely fascinating. I could just look at them for hours. And these cuttle well, I saw some cuttlefish in a tank that had decided to hang out just below some black plastic fronds that looked like seaweed, and some of the um, extensions of the cuttlefish, the arms or the tentacles, were up just, and they looked black. I'm not going to say they were black, but they looked black to me, and they waved in the water just the way the black plastic fronds that looked like seaweed waved. So they had this amazing ability to become Black plastic fronds. It's like something out of a ghost story or something. How did they do that? What are they doing? Because obviously they're still really a cuttlefish. So what are the visual tricks? What, what, what are the trickeries that they've learned over the millennia and millennia in order to be able to achieve these funny kinds of things? And one thing I wrote in the book that, that some of these visual tricks made me think of the Impressionist paintings. Um, they, they trick you with light and shadow and, and, and what looks to be like movement. Sometimes the skin of these animals will look like neon lights, just this energy flowing. And maybe what they're doing is sort of imitating the uh, ripple of water and sunlight overhead. And so you're getting confused because you're looking down on the ocean bottom, but are you seeing the ripple of lights? I, I mean, this is just my own imagination. But, it but is, these It's are, amazing to watch. And oh, it's I, just, it's mesmerizing, isn't it? When, when I was in Roger's lab the, this summer in, in uh, the early 90s, one of my jobs was to feed the tanks of cuttlefish. Mm. And these things were, were anywhere from about that big to the size of rugby balls. Mm. And they appear to communicate between each other. They, they, they will use the same color patterns. That sort of pa They had this thing called passing cloud where there was a, a bar of lighter color that would move across the surface of the cuttlefish. 
Um, and, and they knew that if there was a shadow going through that this was a person coming to feed them and they would respond to that. Um, mm -hmm. They're really, really amazing animals to, to interact with. Mm -hmm. Did you jump in? I didn't. Uh, I ate them. Um, we, we would call them out on a regular basis, and uh, the, the culls would make it on the, the barbecue at the frat house that I lived at for that summer. Um, and then my, my fourth year thesis, my undergrad thesis, was studying uh, uh, visual perception in, in, in a set of those cuttlefish. It was, it was an interesting project. But actually, so that the camouflage stuff, Roger was working on that project when I was in the lab, and my, my job for the summer was to follow a set of chromatophores, these um, pigment <coughs> groups of cells through the development of the squid, and, and I never managed to actually get that part to work. Um, but he's been thinking about that project at least since 1990 when I was a student in his lab. So that, that's been a long-term project. Hmm. Well, it's, back it's to fascinating. Colin for a second. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you know, I'm sitting here thinking it's very interesting, and of course I'm trying to now think about you know students in in our classes, and it's. Really fascinating listening to to you you speak, Wendy, because the word that keeps coming to mind is curiosity, right? I don't know if you speak right. to high school students or, or or not, but if you do, what do you say to them? Or if you don't, what would you say when you go to talk to a group of high school students? First of all, you know about squid and everything that you've learned, but just sort of in general about about science and the process. Well, I I do sometimes. I mean, if I'm mm -hmm. asked to come and talk to high school students, I do do that. Actually, I was up in a high school north of. Boston a couple of weeks ago, and I did go and talk to Rob Yeoman's students too. And you know what I just tell them is that when it comes to understanding an animal like this, the world's wide open. There are so many different ways that you can approach to look at this. And and I, what I tried to do in the book is give a whole spectrum of people who are interested in this animal, from Julie, who's out there in this grueling situation carrying around animals that are almost as heavy as her and covered in squid ink and her hands are all cut up and she loved it. And then going all the way to the whole other end of the spectrum where you have um, scientists who are working on really basic molecular stuff like, like Joe. You know, of course, Joe himself has lived the whole spectrum himself, going from being a collector <laughs> to now being stuck in a lab, maybe sometimes a little more than he might like. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, when it, that that's what's interesting to me is in a field like this, you're not locked in. It depends mm. on your personality, depends on what you're interested in. But I do think one thing that you have to be is curious about the world. You have to be curious about the world and you have to be enthusiastic about what you're curious about and say, wow, who knows, you know. It's a, it's it, it's a, it's so almost like a Disney World for adults, in a sense, you know, and that you're always getting excited and there's always something new around the corner that's amazing. You never know who's going to pop up or, or what great discoveries is going to happen that's going to change your world. That as happened with Joe, isn't that mm -hmm. isn't that true? Yeah, that's absolutely true. You were sort of. Well, I was. You're at ground zero in a way. Yeah. Well, I was an oceanography guy and and uh, was interested in the squid from a, a diving perspective, just curiosity about marine life in general. And then through going to lectures at the MBL and understanding what the organisms were used for, I became more and more of a cellular person and now, as Wendy said, kind of a molecular biologist. Mm -hmm. um, so I still like squid. And um, we, you guys mentioned that you can eat them and you can do research on them, and you can also use them for fish bait. So they're a very utilitarian <laughs> organism, a lot of uses. I, I wanted to ask Thomas if you could do research on the eating, right, like, you know, best sauces, <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, you know what? There, there, there has been an intense scientific controversy going on for quite a while that I wrote about in the book, and that controversy is, is the flesh of giant squid good to eat or not good to eat? Mm. And what exactly does it taste like? Does it mm. taste like turpentine? Is it more Battery like gasoline? <laughs> <laughs> so there is research in that area going on. A question for you. Uh, you know, we, we talk about you spending time in the lab, you know, and doing all this wonderful research. And we talk about, you know, uh, being out in the water and, uh, you know, kind of getting involved with your research in a hands-on perspective. 
And I think it's important to maybe share with some of the listeners about your experience um, with the hands-on aspect of this. Uh, you were quoted as saying that you've had to, you know, dissect or, you know, cut into, you know, thousands of, of squid over the years, and that might not be the most fun for some people out there. I mean, you got to get your hands dirty. Julie in the book got her hands dirty. She's got squid ink all over her and stuff, you know. She's sliding around the deck and whatnot, you know, and you're out there cutting them up. Like, this is not for the faint of heart. You really have to be a strong believer in your research and what you're doing. Just just talk a little bit about that aspect of it. I'm always really curious to see it. It's not your typical job where you're, you know, reading a book or pushing a pencil, you know. Yeah, so I, I didn't mention... Uh, in between my diving career and my, my science career, I actually had a little company where I dissected squid for the scientists at MBL. So I, I would get the organisms from the collecting facility, the Marine Resources Center, and then dissect either the axons or the brain tissue mm -hmm. uh, from squid and then sold the tissue to the scientists. And in those days, I dissected an awful lot of squid. In fact, I would I would start if we were doing the uh, the brain dissection. Uh, you can you can take take the brains out in about uh, uh, 10 seconds, something like that. And I would start after work at five o'clock, and I would often see the sun come up before I was finished with the tank of squid. And it was just you know five gallon buckets of. Uh, Carcasses at the end of the day, and uh, I didn't I didn't Not enjoy that part difficult. very much. And uh, <laughs> I did. There was also a time when every single piece of clothing I owned had squid ink on it, uh, I, burned I, into the fabric. I say that as well. How about today, though? Is that one clean? <laughs> this one is clean because I, I do much less dissecting. But you probably can, guys probably can't see it, but there is a squid on there. There is. <laughs> oh yes, there is. Very cool. This one Very was cool. uh, from Menemsha, a beautiful little harbor out on Martha's Vineyard. Oh. So, yeah. I think I think one of, one of the qualifications for being a biologist of almost in almost any area is that you have to be happy about getting your hands dirty, wouldn't you say, John? Absolutely. So I, I have four students from Providence College that just started yesterday in the laboratory, so they're getting a heavy dose of squid dissection. <laughs> but it isn't one of the ironies, Joe, now that we're, I mean, you're at the same point in your career, I think, roughly that I am, and, and you know, I get to sit down at the microscope and look at flies once a month if I make, if I force that to happen. You know, I do so little hands-on science now. Uh, it, you know, you, you get into this because you love working with the, the system, and then once you get up in your career, uh, there's less and less the hands-on science, more writing the grants, hiring the people, writing the papers. Uh, Absolutely. You've got to find a, way to, you gotta find a way to keep your hands dirty. Well, you know, since I'm, I'm pretty busy teaching during the college school year, so we're very excited to be up in Woods Hole now, and I do get a little bit of a chance to uh, work with the students and uh, get a little bit dirtier than usual. We're coming to that point in the show where we uh, should be thinking about wrapping up. Uh, Wendy and Joe, it's been a wonderful discussion here today. Where can people who are listening to the uh, podcast contact you to get more information about you? Uh, Wendy, your book, obviously, and Joe, your research. Where would you point them? Joe, let's start with you. Yeah, they can uh, try to contact me through the Marine Biological Laboratory or through the Biology Department at Providence College. Uh, that, that information is on the web, and it should be pretty easy to find. You send me that link, Joe. We'll make sure we put that in the show notes at tys.vrock.ca. And Wendy? I have a book blog called krakenbook.com, mm -hmm. in which it's sort of, it, it's half all the nice publicity the book's gotten. I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> but it's also about all kinds of other fun things that uh, we might encounter on our squid journeys. We uh, had up there a wonderful picture of a librarian who came up to visit us at one of the talks and showed us her secret tattoo on her ankle. It was an octopus reading a book. So my husband took nice. a picture of that. We put that up on the blog. You'll find all kinds of things there. Let's go to uh, Thomas and Colin for one last comment or question, please. Oh, I don't know if I can come up with a short one. Um, okay, if we can <laughs> keep it short. Joe, um, we talked to Wendy about the, the things maybe she didn't expect to, to run into when she started working with scientists. Were you surprised working with a journalist and author? I mean, was there some quirk of Wendy that, well, I had no idea that authors did that? 
<laughs> I burped a lot. No, just kidding. Well, I really enjoyed working on this uh, with Wendy, and, and uh, what I've done, you know, a number of interviews over the years, and the one thing that set Wendy apart is sort of the back and forth that we had um, over the time that she was writing the book. So I felt like I, I got a little bit of an inside look at, at her work all along. And that was a lot of fun to, to be part of that experience. And I've asked her many uh, technical uh, aspects of journalism and writing, the process and so on. And uh, mm -hmm. it's been an education for me as well. That's great. Thanks. Colin? Yeah, yeah an interesting give and take there. Um, just a simple question, and I guess I... It, it's the same question, but you'll have different answers, both of you. I'm just wondering what's next. You know, Joe, where do you hope to go in, in terms of research? Um, and, you know, to Wendy, is there a, is there a Kraken 2.0 coming out, or, or are you in, involved in something else uh, that, that we can look forward to? Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, we're, we're starting to work on this Alzheimer's uh, mm -hmm. aspect of this transport very process, cool. and I'm very excited about that. And we've got the students here for the summer. We'll be rolling in Woods Hole until September when our school uh, classes start up again. And, uh, you know, science is slow, so we probably have a few years ahead of us before we solve uh, Alzheimer's, but we're going to give it a go. Good stuff. Wonderful. And well, sorry, Wendy, go ahead. I, I was just going to say um, my funding foundation, the Ocean Foundation in Washington, is um, – getting ready to help me get grants to do a book about coral reefs. So we're going to be traveling the world, learning about coral reefs. Awesome. I was going to suggest fruit flies, but, but coral reefs are probably good. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I did squid. I now need. <laughs> well, if you're looking for a high school teacher to go with you, you let me know. <laughs> I'm sure there will shameless. be. <laughs> shameless, Jago. Shameless. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. On that note, a special okay. thank you to uh, Mrs. Merritt, Thomas's mother, for putting this connection uh, through today. And uh, hey, Colin, I've never heard Dr. Thomas Merritt sound so brilliant. I think he made a special effort thinking that his mother would be tuning in today. Yeah. What do you think? He knows mom's going to watch this one, absolutely. So hi, mom. He did a great job, didn't he? Hi, mom. <laughs> Wendy and Joe, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. Um, I know there will be a lot of interest in the book. And, uh, Thomas, thanks for passing that book along to uh, Colin and I again. We really appreciate that. And uh, on behalf of Wendy and Joe and talk, Dr. Thomas Merritt from Laurentian University, Colin Jago from the Kawartha Pinehurst District School Board, it's Kevin Kugler of Virtual Researcher on Call, saying thanks very much for tuning in again to This Week in Science and Education. See you same time next week, everybody. Have a safe and happy week. Bye-bye.